for that very generous introduction. And thank you everyone here at UW for having me here. This is a tremendous morning. Already in the few hours I've been here, I'm seeing former students and residents and colleagues. So it has a bit of a homecoming, even though the last time I set foot here, I was interviewing for residency uh, many years ago. Um, what I'm going to talk about today uh, is achieving excellence in diagnostic reasoning. Um, diagnosis and management are both important realms uh, where we have to reason and use our knowledge and judgment, but I'll give an undue focus on to diagno onto diagnosis. And the reason is that diagnosis is a core aspect of physicianship in every field that we entertain ourselves in or find ourselves practicing in. It's something that we're good at in medicine, but we're not great at. It turns out that our diagnostic error rate in medicine consistently over the decades sits at about 10 to 15 percent. And then for especially such as ours, internal medicine, diagnosis is a core part of our identity. It's something that people expect us to do perhaps better than all others. And it's something that forms a major theme in the work that we do and something we try to get better at. Uh, about a decade ago, I got interested in finding out how you could really become excellent at this core skill, this thing that defines what we do uh, as internists. And I was disappointed to learn that in medicine, the really that question hasn't been answered. That is to say, we've never asked the question in medicine, what goes into making a master clinician? And in particular, we've never gone into the question and investigated what goes into making the mind of a master clinician. That's something that has interested me and at times I've been obsessed with. And I found that the answers exist, but they exist outside of medicine. And other professions and other fields have looked at this question and said, how does one develop adroit judgment and reasoning skills? And I want to propose a roadmap that we can take from those other fields and adapt that to our day-to-day -day work. And as we go about doing that, I'd like for you to have two things in mind. One is a, a physician that you may have worked with who really excels in that regard. You learned from them, worked with them, admired them from a distance, but they were incredibly adroit and skilled in their diagnostic judgment and reasoning. And then also have in mind your personal aspirations in that regard, where you are now and where you'd like to be. Uh, because the purpose of these 40 minutes is to try to build a bridge between those two images. Society is really interested in expertise. We're really interested, so I'm gonna, this is like a leash, but I'm gonna try to walk with it. Um, society is really interested in people who succeed. And certainly, uh, the people who succeed occupy the popular press, but it's important to know that they occupy the academic press as well. And we study them in an academic sense, not just to add on undue adoration that they already have, and it's not to put successful people on a pedestal. The reason people who succeed and are experts in their field are studied is so that we can shine a light on them and learn about their methods. Because if you wanted to succeed in politics or business or music or sports, there's no shortage of bestsellers or interviews or biographies and even academic studies on what those people did to get where they are. There's no guarantee that you can match them in their performance, but at a bare minimum, all the methods and steps that they took are out there, public and available for consumption and trying to go after. But if you wanted to be like this guy, you would find yourself largely on your own. Medicine really hasn't asked, what does it take to become like House MD? And of course, we have these phrases that we share and repeat from generation to generation. If someone says, how do I become this smart? You might hear, you might hear it parroted in the hallways, see a lot of patients, read a lot, keep up with the literature. Those are sort of timeless phrases that get passed on and on, but they really don't have any traction to them at all. On a simple level, none of them have been studied. There's never been a study to see if seeing a lot of patients or keeping up with the literature actually makes you adroit at judgment and reasoning. But more importantly, those phrases, while they're easy to endorse, they actually lack face validity. Every doctor tries to see as many patients as they can of their job demands and tries to read to the best of their ability. So those sort of phrases don't really differentiate between two doctors' different performance or even your performance at one phase of your career versus your other. They really don't answer the question and what goes into the difference between making someone going from good to great. And when we don't have that answer and we don't have methods to apply to people who really want to achieve that, we leave trainees, young physicians, or even the people who are mentoring either one of those groups in a bit of a lurch. We kind of have a destination without a roadmap. We have an end point but no guide on how to get there. But we can learn from other professions and try to figure out what it is that they do to get their professionals there. Now, I should be very clear, 
Um, what we're talking about here is diagnostic reasoning and management reasoning to a smaller degree, but that's just one pillar of excellence. Like I said, there's no literature on how you become a great clinician or a master clinician, cognitively speaking, but there's a marvelous multi-century literature on what it is to be a great clinician. And that literature always settles on two, two pillars. One relates to this cognitive element that I'm discussing and will focus on, but the other relates to the humanistic element, the communication, the interpersonal connection that you make. And we should make no mistake here, even though we have a laser-like focus on one for this session, that you have to be good at both if you really want to be a great clinician. In the real world, they are intertwined, and there's no way to be good at one without the other, and experience teaches you that each informs the other. If you're good at one, it will feed into the other, and it goes vice versa. But what we're doing in this hour is artificial. We're disentangling the two just to put a focus on one. But I don't want anyone to think that this alone is the key to becoming a great physician. If you really did have that focus and that myopic viewpoint alone, you would run a risk of becoming the caricature that House MD is. And that's not a destiny or endpoint we want for anyone here. So let's get down to business. That is sort of the background, and that is where, that's where we are at now, the state of the art of medicine's knowledge on how to go from good to great. But what we really need to do is understand how our experience and learning over time plays into this uh, quest. So this is a curve about how humans perform on any task that we try to learn. This can be something inside of medicine, like inserting a central line, running a family meeting, suturing a wound, listening to a heart. And it just as easily can apply to something outside of the medical world. It's any skill a human learns, typing, raising a child, playing golf, what have you. And that is to say, when we first start an endeavor, we have a kind of rough go at it. The first couple of days, weeks, months of anything we try oftentimes isn't smooth sailing. But very, very soon we hit our stride and we get on a very steep part of the learning curve. And what happens in almost all fields, especially in professional fields, is after about five years of immersion in authentic practice, authentic work, you get very good at handling 80 to 90 percent of the problems that walk through the door of your clinic or office. This applies to medicine, law, engineering, you name it, sort of an immutable law of uh, skill development in humans. And when you get to that point, it's actually a really comforting inflection point. But it comes with a bit of a price, and that is to say, once you understand how you handle everything that comes in the door, then the number of challenges that you face per day starts to decrease. When the number of challenges per day starts to decrease, then the amount of learning you get per day starts to decrease. And when the amount of learning you get per day starts to decrease in a learning industry or a cognitive industry, and that's what we are in, we are in a cognitive industry, then the rate of your performance improvement starts to flatten off. To be clear, the curve continues to go up and up and up. I didn't, I didn't show the end point of this curve. There is an end point which goes in the opposite direction. But for the most, for the most of your career, you, you go on a slow but upward trajectory. And what you find yourself on is being on the path to becoming an experienced physician. And this experienced physician does a marvelous service to his or her patients, his colleagues, her, teach, her students. All of them benefit from the wealth of experience and knowledge that this person builds. But what doesn't happen is that that person doesn't wind up becoming an expert. That is to say, they don't achieve their maximal performance in a given pr procedure, in this case the procedure I'm talking about is reasoning, that they could have if they had applied all the techniques that exist to optimize judgment and reasoning. And the key point about this is that experience alone doesn't make you an expert. It's, it's something everyone will realize once you think about this. There's a lot of things we all do for a long period of time, but we're not experts in. I've been writing since grade school. I've been typing since middle school. I've been driving since high school. I've been suturing since medical school. But in none of those things would I call myself great at it. I'm good. I'm good enough. But I did what humans do in all endeavors that they're trying to learn, which is I improved until I was good enough at what I needed to be, and then I diverted my energy elsewhere. So there's a reason the Writers Guild isn't coming to find me based on my writing that started in grade school. And there's a reason NASCAR is not knocking on my door to have me join their ranks. And I'm still waiting for my uh, offer letter from the Department of Surgery based on my suturing skills. There's a reason those things aren't happening, and that's because I haven't reinvested energy when those things became easier to, to get better and better at them. I put my energy elsewhere. And because of that, I landed on the experience curve. And that is fine, but I didn't achieve my maximal potential in any of them. And if we think about how we do that in medicine, we have our question really for ourselves, for the things that we do care about. Maybe I don't care about typing and driving that much, but I certainly care about running a family meeting or doing a procedure properly or reasoning and judgment, is what is it that I have to do or that you have to do to be on the steep part of the learning curve throughout your entire career? 
And like I said, it's not experience alone, but we should be clear. There's no mystery why two doctors who are in practice maybe 10 years versus two years might have a difference in their performance. There still is an upward curve. The real mystery is why you might have two doctors who are in the same training program, work in the same clinic, have the same starting point, and have the same patients, could have wildly divergent performances around something like diagnostic reasoning and judgment, knowledge and skill in that area. What is it that they have that puts one on the steep part of the curve and one on the flat part? And the answer that comes from all other fields where this has been studied, and it's been studied in chess and ICU nursing and firefighting and a legion of other professions, is that people who wind up being experts in cognitive fields found a way to get more learning on the job than everyone else. They become experts at learning on the job. They have the same work burden as everyone else, but they know how to dial up two different variables to leave a stronger imprint on their brain. When they go through their day-to-day -day work, they either increase the number of times that their brain has to see a problem. It could be monocular blindness, gout, jaundice, you name it. And they increase the number of times the brain has to tackle it. Or even if they have the same fixed number of times that they see that problem, they increase the quality of that imprint on their brain. They go back and collect feedback on it. They reflect on it. They talk to a colleague. They add some emotional weight so that there's a stronger imprint on their brain the next time it has to tackle that problem. They're always in the mindset not just of solving the problem then, but putting an imprint on their brain so when they have to solve it next time, if it's a little tougher or a little more difficult or a little more nuanced, they'll be prepared. And what you see is that learning, in some sense, is a lot like immunization. What matters is not just that initial inoculum, the first time I see pneumonia or the first time I see multiple myeloma. What matters also is the booster shots that I get, both the potency and the frequency, so that people who wind up being experts in reasoning and judgment build their knowledge in this way, that they pay attention to how good that inoculum is, but how many times they face uh, additional exposures. And in some ways, if my PowerPoint skills were better, you would get the sense that there's really two dependent independent variables here. You can dial up quantity and quality, and then the dependent axis, which would be coming out at you in sort of a z-axis way, would be the learning, which admittedly goes in this zigzag pattern. Learn, forget, learn, forget, learn, forget. But the cumulative, uh, cumulative effect of that exposure is a very robust and nuanced memory that the brain bring, brings to future problems. It's remarkable, but the immune system's memory system works a lot like our memory immune system, or our memory uh, system works as well. And the, or sorry, the memory cells of the immune system work a lot like those of the brain. And that's something that we should keep in mind as we try to optimize our own exposures or that of our trainees. What I'd like to do is switch gears and then share four methods based on that background that people do in fields where expertise is achieved in judgment and reasoning and cognition and see if we can apply that to medicine. The first of them uh, comes from a uh, couple named Breiter and Scardamelia, who over 20 years ago took a look at the difference between expert teachers and experienced teachers. And if we really want to get inspiration, we're going to have to go outside of medicine to find this. What they did was they studied the differences in the work habits and learning habits between these two cohorts of teachers, which they found uh, and followed for a long period of time. And what they uh, conceptualized, which I think few people would have a problem uh, agreeing with, is that when you enter a profession, your learning is a series of to-do to -do tasks. You have a list of things that you have to learn and get better at. So a new teacher might have to say, well, I have to learn how to develop a lesson plan, and I need to learn how to discipline a child, and I need to learn how to communicate with parents. And sure enough, over time, as both cohorts of teachers start getting practice, they start getting good at those things. And then they get to that comfortable inflection point where they sort of get to check them off their to-do list, like discipline a child, check, lesson plan, check, communication with parents, check. But the majority of teachers then do what the majority of humans do, which is once they get to that comfortable point where they know how to do that, they constrain their mental bandwidth and the energy it takes to do their job, and they liberate their mental energy elsewhere, typically to something outside their job. And that's fine, and those teachers do a wonderful service to the kids and the families that they serve over their years. They're on their way to becoming experienced. But the expert teachers, when they looked at them, what they found was that the minute, virtually the minute that they got competent in those things, instead of just checking the boxes off their mental to-do list, they added new things on top of their to-do list. So they would say, I know how to make a lesson plan. Now I'm going to make a lesson plan for um, uh, the substitute teacher could uh, adapt easily. I know how to discipline a child. Now I'm going to discipline it, figure out how to discipline a child with special needs. I know how to communicate with parents. I'm going to figure out, figure out how you communicate with parents who have English as a second language. And 
of course, all teachers would do that when the moment comes and they have to do that. The difference was these teachers did it habitually. They sort of created a more nuanced and harder problem for themselves before the moment arrived so that they were prepared to perform when that day happened. And it's a remarkable achievement because in reality what it's doing is it's making your work and life harder when it's the exact same moment that you could go on autopilot because it's the silver platters there for it to become easier. It's not hard to imagine how we could adapt that sort of mindset to medical practice and what we do in taking care of patients, just like teachers who are taking care of kids. Uh, you could envision two uh, practicing physicians or two practicing trainees, if you have a teacher's mindset on this, and watch as they take care of a patient with cellulitis. And the trainee or practitioner who is on the path to being experienced and doing wonderful service for their patients will see a patient with lower extremity erythema, consider an alternative diagnosis like DVT or gout perhaps. Um, they will prescribe a familiar antibiotic for the cellulitis, educate the patient, and send them on their way. And that is perfect. That's fine. And if that's done for 40 years, it's marvelous. The experience, or so the resident who's on the path to being expert or a faculty member who is there will do the exact same thing. They'll go through that patient with the exact same ease, but then they will do just something extra that makes that routine case not so routine for themselves. It has to be efficient because we're all busy in clinic and it has to be pragmatic, something that might benefit them in the future. So they might do something like, let me look up on my phone real quick, two more mimics of cellulitis besides gout and uh, DVT. Or they might say, you know, I chose not to cover MRSA. I'm going to catch the ID fellow after lunch and just say if, see if she agrees that that was a wise choice. Or I was moving fast. If I had my student with me, I'd have to figure out two quick teaching points that I would give as we were walking to the next page what would those be? And what you find is that that person is already trying to prepare themselves for the future. Because we have a lot of easy cases in our work, as much as we have challenging cases, and we appreciate them. They lubricate the clinic, they allow us to move fast and get through a busy ward service, but they're also past opportunities for learning and challenge unless you make them so. And some people have the skill to do it really efficiently. It's like micro-teaching and challenges all day long. Uh, Joan Sargent, she looked at this phenomenon in high-performing physicians in Canada. She looked at the top-performing family physicians in very busy practices, and what she found was they had this two-track two, uh, mindset. Just like everyone else, super busy, seeing a ton of patients, but they always had this ability to focus on the patient and then focus on the smallest amount of learning over time. And the cumulative benefit of all that micro-learning led to the expertise that they possessed over their colleagues. And it's a refreshing approach. Instead of getting satisfaction in what we do know, it was actually a laser-like focus on what we don't know and that quest to improve. And it gets to a point about uh, improvement. We oftentimes can't, uh, we can't handle, or we, sorry, we can't be in control of what walks in the ER, or what comes in on call, or what walks into our clinic. It's rare that we're in control of that, but we're decidedly in control of what we get out of it. And that's a mindset I think we should adapt as often as we can. The second approach, um, as I mentioned earlier, the, sec uh, the, se the second approach plays off the fact that we're in a performance industry, but in particular, we're in a prediction performance industry. That is to say, if you're in the business of making diagnoses, which we all are, and embarking on management plans, it's really making an educated and informed prediction based on imperfect information. Occasionally, life is clear cut, but most of the time, it's not. So we make our best prediction on what our patient has. Um, and it turns out that prediction has been studied in a very rigorous way in academic fields, and that there are a number of uh, fields that are quite good at prediction. In fact, there are two that sit at the top of the list, and regrettably, medicine is not one of them in terms of predictive ability. Um, it may come to surprise to a lot of people, but the one that occupies the top position in predictive ability is meteorology. So uh, despite all the jokes, despite all the jokes the weatherman sustains over his or her career, the meteorologist, when you get down to the statistics, are remarkably accurate at predicting their work. And this precedes the advent of supercomputers, which are certainly a great help to them. But just their raw work themselves they're quite good at. The jokes are unfounded uh, in many ways. If you want to read about it in some detail, by the way, Nate Silver of political fame has a book called uh, The Signal and the Noise, and he has a chapter or two devoted to this phenomenon. But you ask yourself, well, what is it about uh, the weatherman or the weatherwoman that could make them so good at making predictions? Well, there's one, there are many elements to their, their profession, but one of the core ones that undoubtedly is at the heart of it is that they get a ton of feedback. They literally make a prediction, 
look out the window, probably hear from unhappy people also, and they have the opportunity to improve their performance the next day. They have the opportunity to learn and recalibrate on a daily basis. So in a field that has to make judgments, they are awash in feedback and the opportunity to learn. Um, I'm going to take a diversion for a second and talk about another human task, which is driving. And then I'll bring the two together. Does anyone know what percentage of people in America think they're an above average driver? <laughs> anyone know? <laughs> what are the guesses? 90%. 90, yeah, the 80, 90 percent realm. It is statistically impossible, this Lake Wobegon phenomenon where everyone feels they are an above average driver and everyone else is an idiot, right? That's, that's what people uh, proceed. And why is that? Well, there is probably an innate human tendency towards overconfidence. And it's actually, a, it's uh, probably serving in some domains. But there's an important aspect of driving that none of us realize until you step back and study the phenomenon. And that is that every day I drive to and from work, to and from school, to and from the store, and I get home without a sentinel event, like a major accident, a traffic tickers, ticket, someone laying in their horn as I go by. I create the story in my mind that I'm a good driver. And that happens day in, day out, over and over again. And that cumulative, um, cumulative effect of no news is good news starts to give me the sense, of, listen, I'm great at this. I'm really, really good. Where are those NASCAR people? They should have been calling me. But over time, what happens is that story starts to take on a life of its own. Our world in medicine, the practice that we do, particularly related to our diagnostic decisions and our management decisions, is a lot more like the life of a driver than it is like the meteorologist. If you think about what we do, we are, very, we are very limited in the amount of feedback we get. We make a huge number of decisions. The decision density in some environments, like the emergency room or the inpatient ward, as two examples, is huge. Decisions per time or decisions per a unit of patient. And we get a very, very limited amount of feedback on how they do. There's all sorts of reasons for this. We rotate on and off services. Uh, patients go between healthcare systems. EMRs aren't interchangeable. Studies take three months or six months follow-up. Uh, the list goes on and on about why we may not find out what happens to a patient. But there's a really pernicious effect of that. In fact, there's two. One is that we leave a ton of learning on the table. We miss the chance to learn and see how diseases really unfold. But more importantly, we lose the chance to recalibrate ourselves. And that is vitally important. Now, in driving, that issue can be partially remediated, remediated if you put this in people's car. If you put an onboard or on mirror dash uh, camera, I mean, this is called the drive cam, there are other ones, and put it in people's cars, record what happens for two to three weeks and give them a concise summary and some screenshots and video shots of what happens, people quickly lower their estimation of their driving to the more rational <laughs> 50 to 60 percent, which is exactly where they should be. And they learn some sobering things. We learned that the yellow light we thought we were running was actually red, uh, that when we swerved into a lane and thought that we had plenty of space because no one honked, when you see the video image of the gesture the driver behind you make, you realize it's too close for comfort. And even some really sobering things, like when we took a, a curve on it while we were talking on our cell phone and thought that went well, we had no idea that a little girl on a bike was just five feet away. All of those things start to register, and the drivers who are prone to overconfidence wind up saying, listen, I'm not as good as I thought. I have capacity to improve. And they have specific things on which they can improve. But in medicine, we have to work very, very hard to get to that point. Um, I work in urgent care, so I'm an internist, but at my, the, the VA hospital where I work, the emergency room is staffed by internists. So I spend half my time there and half my time on the inpatient wards. And in a day of emergency room care, I can take care of 20, 25 patients, me and the residents, and I may never, ever learn what happened to. I feel good in the moment. It's like driving to and from work. I feel great about the work I did, but I may never know what really happened to those patients. And that's a very, very dangerous thing. I may take care of someone who has cervical lymphadenopathy and a fever, for instance. And I see him, and he's a young, healthy vet, and I say, this certainly sounds like a URI, maybe mono. And I make that judgment, and I send him on my way. If I have the diligence to find out what happened to him, either calling him, checking the EMR, maybe running into his PMD, and I found out that my diagnosis was correct, this was a URI that's self-resolved, then I have the opportunity to tell my brain, all things being equal in the future, if you see that type of patient proceed in that way, it worked, it was logical, that's the building of experience. 
Conversely, if I find out that three weeks later he's admitted because I missed his non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, the cervical lymphadenopathy and fever, I have the and maybe I found out again by calling him, checking the EMR, or hearing from his PMD, I have the opportunity to improve by saying all things being equal in the future, I need to do better. I should have palpated other nodes. I should have took his notion of weight loss a little more seriously. And I have the opportunity to improve if I see that problem again, if my brain faces that problem again. But because I work in urgent care, right, I don't know what happens to the vast majority of my patients, and many of you will find yourself in similar workplace scenarios, a ton of my patients fall into the unknown category. And what does the human brain do? Unfortunately, the human brain operates under a no news is good news paradigm. If I don't know what happens to the patient, I just plow that into the positive outcome category. It's no different. I could spend a whole day seeing 20 patients in urgent care and feel great about myself even though the guy that I saw three weeks ago is sitting across the hall getting chemotherapy dripped into his veins because I misjudged or misdiagnosed his case. And I'll never have the chance to improve or learn on account of that. So what we really need to do in medicine is think about how we can get this feedback. If we don't get this feedback, what we really do is we run the risk of developing confidence without competence. We run the risk of developing confidence, but not accuracy. And those are two things. Our patients need a lot more of the latter, not more confidence on our part. Now, to do this, it takes a little bit of effort. It's, I'm not saying this is easy, but I am saying it's very, very important. And uh, every one of you will have your own system that you develop. Oops. Oh, sorry. I have PowerPoint. I said this is what it should be. I'm sorry. I have to fix one slide because that got misappropriated. So could... There we go. Okay. Everyone needs to develop their own system of how they would track this, how they would do this. I've had um, fellows I know, uh, a GI fellow I knew and a neurology resident I know kept an Excel spreadsheet. People increasingly are able to do this on their EMR where they can tag their own list and try to follow along that way. This is what I do. Don't tell the HIPAA police. I'll deny this if it ever happens. I will have this edited out of the footage for this video. But what I do, because I do this in the service of my patients, is I put this on my password protected phone, that's the best I can do, is this is how I keep track of my patients. And you can develop your own system HIPAA compliant or quasi compliant, what have you. But the importance is that you have a system. And just to point out some of the things that are here, the first is I can't do this on every patient I see, but I definitely try to do it on a sample of them. The second is that I don't do it just on the fascinating patients. Everyone's good at keeping track of, hey, does this person have a pheochromocytoma or mastocytosis? Completely fascinated, that'll be a sticky that you put on your computer screen and hope to remember in a couple weeks' time. To really get good at feedback and or get feedback that's worthwhile, you have to do it on the common problems that the brain is going to see over and over and over again. It's not really critical that you get good at pheo and amyloidosis, but it's really critical that you get good at CHF versus pneumonia, or that you get good at stroke versus migraine, or that you get good at cellulitis versus gout. Those are the things that need to occupy the feedback list, and that's one of the most important things we do. And you have to find a way to make it so that you'll have time to check it. What I do is I set my timer so I set a place where I know the test that I care about or the appointment that I care about will be done, that I will be sitting in front of a computer or I'll be near the colleague that I need to talk about. And that way it's off my mental, so out of my short-term memory, but it's certainly in my long-term memory, and I'm dialing in the minute I'm going to get the learning on this patient. And it works remarkably well, and I will tell you, it is one of the most humbling things you ever do. To, if you want to get the maximal learning you'll ever do, just follow up on your patients. It is one of the most humbling and most educational things you ever, ever do. But it is the key to optimizing judgment and reasoning. There has never, ever in the history of biology nor industry been a system that doesn't optimize itself with constant feedback, and there's no reason to think that we would be an exception to that rule. Uh, as a final point, does anyone know what the other professionals are that have incredibly adroit uh, predictive value and judgment? I guess besides the weatherman, I, th I know that caught people off guard already. <laughs> What's that? Economy? No. <laughs> I think that's a joke, right? <laughs> the, the other profession that's very, very good at this and, uh, is uh, bookies at the racetrack. So when studied, bookies at the racetrack have remarkable predictive ability. But if you think about the commonality, they also take data, make a prediction all day long, and keep getting feedback on whether they're right or wrong. Of course, the field is also corrupt and fixed, but that's, that's not of importance to us. And you can decide who you want to emulate, if you want to be the meteorologist or the bookie or some other professional of that sort. But think of a plan that you can do to make system uh, feedback from being random and haphazard to systematic and focused on improvement for the future. Okay. 
the last two methods that I uh, mentioned um, uh, really focus on dialing up the quality of experience that you have. That is to say, you're not changing the number of times you see patients, you're just getting more out of it. You're either trying to learn in the moment super efficiently, or you're tracking your patients over time with the intent to recalibrate and lower your self-estimation of your diagnostic skill as a motivation to get better and better at it. But there's other ways to increase uh, judgment and reasoning. And in other professions, what they do is they simply increase the number of times the brain tackles a problem. Um, and that's in turning up the quantity part of the equation. Um, certainly, the easiest way to do this is not seeing more patients. You've, you'll be uh, hard pressed to find a doctor who's looking to find more patients to see. We're all plenty busy in that regard. But there's no reason that you can't use simulation to do this. In all other industries where high stakes decision makers have to make high stakes decisions, the industry puts them through simulation training. Pilots sit in flight simulators. The military does war game. Businesses do case studies. And even in medicine now, we've come to uh, accept simulation for psychomotor procedures, like a central line or a laparoscopy. But we've been super slow to adopt it for cognitive procedures. And the cognitive procedure of diagnosis is probably our most important one. The industry which we can learn from isn't a bona fide profession in itself, uh, but it is an important sport, and that is from chess. So sometimes chess has been called the drosophila of uh, clinical reasoning research or expertise research. And the reason is, in the same way that hundreds of millions of drosophila have been sacrificed so we could learn more about genetics, so too have scores of chess masters and chess grandmasters been studied so we can get insight into how someone could possess such a robust and nuanced memory and skill set to solve problems in their jobs. And one of the insights from that line of reasoning, among many, is that they spend an extraordinary amount of time, the grandmasters that is, in solitary study. That is to say, they study, but they study chess games. They don't read chess theory. They don't read evidence-based chess. They read chess matches. And they read chess because they want to play, they want those games to imprint on their mind. And so they don't just read it casually. They don't just say, oh, there's a nice move. The rook went there. The bishop went there. They play along, move by move, step by step, so that they can recreate the mental trace of that game in their mind so they have it accessible when they, fa when they face it in tournament play or otherwise. And it isn't too difficult to think about the jump that we could make in our medical training or our medical experience with the literature to do the same. There's no shortage of cases that come in our inbox or in our mailbox, these days, either one, uh, that give us the opportunity to read cases. But in order to read cases in the way that the pilot or the war game simulator does it or the chess master, you have to do it in a very specific way. I think all of us at our default, if you come across a case report and you have the time and discipline to read it, might tend to read it in a casual way. That is to say, you're reading along, you're really interested in what the mystery or the end diagnosis is, and once that's done, you hope like some illumination will happen. But that doesn't really replicate what the chess master does with their game or the pilot in the flight simulator, and it really sells short the imprint that you can put on your brain. If you really want to get the most out of case reports, these can be super long, like the New England Journal of Medicine, monstrosity every week, or super short, like a rash with a multiple choice quiz. You have to make it as realistic as possible so the brain feels like it's in the authentic environment. So a couple of points. You can't look at the title. I know it sounds weird. You have to discipline yourself not to look at the title, because no one walks into clinic saying, hi, I'm a 45-year-old man with epistaxis, granulomas, and pulmonary infiltrates. No one does that. So you can't. You can't give your brain that artificial clue. You can't look at the treating specialists, uh, or you can't look at the author's treat specialty. I know it sounds difficult and odd, but you really can't. As soon as I see an endocrinologist presenting abdominal pain, I get remarkably good at diagnosing Addison's disease. When in real life, in real life, I have missed that more times than I care to recount or share. And that's because the cognitive reality is a dissonance. No patient walks in saying, I, here's the specialist who's going to cure me. Here's the person who's going to find my answer. And I don't peek ahead to page three or four where I know a path slide or CT image might be lurking because no one walks in and tells me who, what test is going to solve this case. And even if you take the example of multiple choice questions, I read a lot of derm uh, pictures and they oftentimes say, what, give a one-liner, here's a picture, and then what is this rash? The hardest thing in the world, because you look at a rash, you're like, my god, you know, I, that, that's something none of us want to delve into. But if you're forcing yourself to do it, at least you say, well, there's the mercy of five choices. But that's not real life. In real life, no one comes in with a multiple choice question. So you have to cover those and actually form at least one hypothesis on your own before you delve through the options that are presented there. But if you proceed in that fashion and you read cases in that way, you start to turn it into a simulation exercise. 
And the important point about it, though, is it's not the end solution that's important in these long cases you read. It's all about the struggle. Like a pilot would have, it's not sort of the takeoff and landing that the flight instructor is worried about. They're teaching them all these curveballs along the way. And if you look at a case like this, this is from the New England Journal of Medicine a couple years ago. It starts with a rather tragic tale. It's a 25-year-old who has a cardiac arrest and, and inexplicably has an arc that ends with intestinal schistosomiasis as an end diagnosis. Now you may look at this and say, there's no way on earth this comes close to anything I encounter in my daily life, so there's no reason for me to read this case. I'll move on uh, to something else. But I would tell you to find all the hidden gems that are in this. This is a superb simulation exercise. If you were to read it as a simulator, it's a pen and paper exercise, or highlighter as it were, and you would do it this way. You'd knock out an infectious disease doctor presenting a case of cardiac arrest. You don't need to have that artificial and injuncture early on. Then you start right in. At the first line, you say 25-year-old with cardiac arrest. You should stop and say just a couple things, really micro, like what could possibly be causing that? And you start to build that file in your mind of young plus cardiac arrest. As you hear that they're in B-fib, you might take a moment just to make sure you're clear on epi versus vasopressin. A micro moment, and then you carry on. As you learn he's hypotensive, you test your abilities to predict one end organ consequences may follow from that. You may get to the point where you see that he's from South America, and you say, aha, I know young cardiomyopathy, South America. You're like, I know Chagas disease. And then you may say, that's all I know is Chagas disease. <laughs> but that's all right. That is all right because you still tighten the link in your brain between problem solving those three concepts. And that's an honest moment. And if you just went to Wikipedia and typed in Chagas and just got a line or two more about it in your brain and then carried on, that would be marvelous. That would be the goal. And as you got to the coma exam, you could quiz yourself. Uh, I think, you know, as much as we dread rashes, we also dread neuro exams. And this is just as important an opportunity as anywhere else to get a little better. And this is hard work. It takes a lot of time. It, just full confession, this is what I do with the NEJAM. I don't read the review article. I don't read the, the article, the landmark articles that are published. Those will all get to me in other ways. But this is what I spend my time with, and it's time consuming. But just so you know, you can automate the process. The New England Journal of Medicine and a few other journals now have turned this format when they do their clinical problem solving into the interactive case series, and it basically catches the simulation exercise. That is to say, it winds up giving you the case in short order. You make an educated guess on a question that it gives you, you get on the spot learning and then you move on in an iterative fashion. And just for the teachers in the audience, um, you can even bring this to the rounds. I, I do this um, for my team, uh, usually once or twice a month if we have time to do this. I do an exercise, some of the people in this room have gone through this with me and can vouch for it, which is that we put all the trainees' names on the board top to bottom and then we unfold this case in real time from left to right. And what we do is we put everyone's ideas on the board, questions, biases, errors, insights, things they're wondering about, things they would look up. And what it is is a combination of biomedical facts. We'll talk about the Chagas or the pericarditis as it were in this case, but we'll also talk about the reasoning. You know, are we worried about PE because we just heard about that yesterday in morning report? Well, that's availability bias. Are we just pursuing this because we feel like giving antibiotics are safe and we're underestimating the risks of giving them? And if you teach in that manner, when you wind up giving equal airtime to the biomedical facts as you do the clinical reasoning facts, you send a very, very clear message that yes, the biomedical facts are important, but the most important procedure to execute with skill in this job that we have is to reason through them in this way. And it's very easy to send that message if you can model it and show it, and this is the way you can take the reading that you do or make it count twice and do it during your teaching session in real time. I'm very fond of telling people that it's an admitted fact that in the publishing world, case reports have a low impact factor. But in the clinical reasoning and cognitive world, there's nothing that has a higher impact factor than the case report. And we should think about how we can use them, the ones that are well done on paper, on computers, to use them like a cognitive simulator. The last method that uh, uh, I'd like to mention is one that maybe is the best known because of the books that I showed at the opening slide. One of them was Malcolm Gladwell's Outliers. And in that, he elevated the concept that used to live in academic uh, realm, which is deliberate practice. It's a model of how people take a skill that they need and go from good to being great at it. And skill development is an important part of diagnostic judgment and reasoning because there's a ton of skills that subserve that effort. Listening to a murmur, diagnosing a rash, interpreting joint fluid, all of those are skills that you have to get better at. And the concept of deliberate practice is that you try to make a breakthrough in one key area. So you focus on something that needs improvement, continuous pra continue practicing in it until you get enough feedback to close the gap between where you are and where you want to be. On some level, it's not super novel. Anyone who's had a music teacher or a coach knows exactly what this is. We all want to just play. 
So if you have a music, uh, you're playing guitar or piano and you have a whole piece that you just want to keep be getting better and better at by playing, the music teacher eventually is going to stop you and say, no, this is the section that you need to get right and I want you to do this over and over and over again. And once you get that right, then you can play the whole piece. Or we say, hey coach, I really want to play, we really want to scrimmage. And the coach says, no, you will hit cross court backhands until you get 75% of them in the deep court just right. Then you can go ahead and play once you've made that breakthrough. Everyone knows that, everyone has experienced that, but we don't have enough of that medicine. A colleague of mine uh, years ago, a mentor of mine years ago, went to a prestigious school as a visiting student, and one of his goals was to learn more about cardiac auscultation. So he dutifully went on rounds uh, with the professor, and they felt spleens and looked at rashes, and they, um, uh, you know, they listened to a murmur here or there. And in short order, he recognized listening to a murmur to a day with 10 other students is not going to make me great at ca cardiac auscultation. That was his goal for the month. So what he did was he found Every night he went to the pre-op board and found all the patients that were admitted for valve surgery the next day. And he would meet them, listen to their hearts, hear their stories, and follow up what happened to them with their valve pathology afterwards. And that month catapulted his cardiac auscultation skills. And I would say that he, to this day, has cardiac auscultation skills that rival any cardiologist or non-cardiologist. Going around and following the professor listening to a heart here or there is practice. But finding every patient in the hospital who has a valvulopathy and listening to them for a month is deliberate practice. And if we really want to get better at something, do we just stand around and say, well, I hope I get better with time, that is to say, do I wait for experience, or do I get deliberate about something? Now, none of us have the time to chase around every valvulopathy patient in a hospital. That's not a reality anymore. But you certainly can use technology to this advantage. If you want to get better at murmurs, can for one month or six months you keep track of every murmur you see and compare it to the echo outcomes? If you want to get good at rashes, can you take a picture on your phone and either find out what happens in derm clinic or your own follow-up or torture one of your derm colleagues and you keep asking them to teach you what it is? And if even all that's too much, you can just get a rash sent to your inbox every morning and, make sure, and force yourself to never, ever turn off that feature until you get 75% of them right for four consecutive weeks. You can find ways to get deliberate about getting better at one thing. But if we have that mindset, we're always fond of saying we're in the practice of medicine, but what we really need to do is get in the deliberate practice of medicine and make, make breakthroughs in our skills that subserve diagnostic reasoning one skill at a time. Experience is a good teacher, but it's not the best. So what I'm going to have you do in two minutes is turn to your neighbor and discuss some of these things. I think we'll have enough time to do all of this. Um, but I want to do is uh, share one point which I think is worth mentioning and I haven't given enough attention to. Everything that I've talked about here is hard work and takes extra time. There has never, ever in the annals of expertise research in any industry been a profession where people do their best or achieve their own maximal potential without extra work and extra effort. So there's no effort on my part to conceal that that's what these things are. The only thought experiment to consider is whether we can do some of these things which are proven to work in place of some of the highly ineffective things that we do now in order to really put all of us on the steeper part of the learning curve. And what we're really trying to do is not only do it, but maybe do it efficiently, integrate it in our daily workflow and our teaching such that it's not an add-on, because I'm certain of all the four things I mentioned to you, they all sound like add-ons to your busy day, but rather that they become habits. Because habits form once we give people the skills to figure out how to do something, we give them knowledge of the benefit of what they get, and then you build this desire to want to do it. You get addicted to the type of learning that I'm talking about. I don't do all of those things on all days. I do one of those things hopefully every day or so, but it's addictive, especially that feedback part. That is incredibly addictive. And that's the type of thing we're trying to build into our training programs and our work programs and our work environments so that we learn on the job in a way that mimics experts in other fields. So what I'd like to have you do is turn to your neighbor and spend two minutes talking about this. And you can choose the topic. It's really unguided. Some people like to talk about the barriers of how hard this is. Some people like to talk about um, someone they know about that sort of does this in a little way or does it in an amazing way and they'd like to model. Some people want to be really aspirational and think about what they might do changing, the, changing their uh, action steps in the next day after they walk out of this conference. But spend two minutes talking with your colleague. Just discuss anything that comes to mind. I'll give a concluding a slide or two and then we'll do a Q&A. So take two minutes with your neighbor.
<laughs> Attention, please. Hello, hello. Sorry, I don't know how to whistle. I know the whistle is more commanding. Um, so I hate to cut off conversation like this because I think we don't, A, we don't get a chance to chat with our colleagues enough and we don't even get a chance to process the lectures that we sit through. Um, so I hope I didn't interrupt anything uh, incredibly deep. But I want to just re recapitulate and then take us to one final concept, which is what I was trying to do in, in these 40 minutes was just give us some ideas. And these are ideas, they're, they're yet to be proven robustly in medicine, that there are habits from taking our reasoning from going to good to great. And that is to say, can we, instead of doing learning on the job, we all do it when we have to, but can you make it a habit when you don't have to? Can you switch your learning from being PRN, which is I think how we describe it a lot, to being PPS instead? And when it comes to feedback, can we switch it from being kind of a random event where you run into a colleague or stumble across something in the EMR or go into M&M and see your patient being presented and instead make it something that's more systematic and, and focused on our learning? And when it comes to case reading, if you pick cases as the thing you do in reading and we all have limited time, can you switch it from being a spectator sport to a simulation exercise? And when it comes to the skills that we need to get good at diagnosis, can you instead, instead of having full faith in the passage of time will get me better at rashes or murmurs, most of us know how that goes, uh, can you instead get focused on a real effort to improve something, make a breakthrough there, and then go somewhere else? Uh, and the key point about this is that this is all focused on being great. Everyone in this room is destined to be good. In fact, for some of the people in this room, I have firsthand knowledge. Everyone in this room is dead set on being good, and many will go on to be great. But the question is, will you be great? And by great, I mean, will you achieve your own maximal potential? Uh, sometimes uh, this discussion about uh, you know, becoming a great or becoming an expert has sort of a competitive sense to it because some of the academic work that's done really does compare two people, like why is one better than the other, et cetera. But it's really much more of a mindset. You see, it's this continuous quality improvement mindset where you keep trying to improve even when your performance is outwardly acceptable to other people. And although it's a, when you look at the literature, it's probably a mindset that a lot of people adapt early on in their career, the great news is that there's no statute of limitations on when you can adopt this for yourself. Because even though it's sort of said to be in a comparative way and a competitive way, when all is said and done, when you adopt this kind of mindset, you're really just in competition with one person. And that only person is yourself. So thank you very much for your time and your attention, and I look forward to questions.